So um, I'm going to inv uh, wish to invite the panel to come up. Um, this is a panel um, that represents the uh, Chicano Latino Advisory Council, which advises uh, both uh, Provost Brown and President Napolitano on matters of, of impacting the uh, Latino community. And as you, can, as you know, if it impacts the Latino community, Latinx community, it impacts California and it impacts University of California. I'm just gonna state very quickly, what are the four areas that the council has identified where we are moving forward? And that is on improving leadership pathways for uh, Chicano Latino faculty, administrators, and students. Advancing the preparation, access, recruitment, and retention of Chicano Latino uh, students. Bolstering UC efforts to diversify faculty and staff and cultivating opportunities for the university to engage with the broader Chicanx community. Now, guess what? These all sound like you've heard about these for the last many decades, as has been mentioned. So part of what we should be thinking about and collaborating here is, how are things going to be different this time? And how are you going to sustain that rethinking, that restructuring that needs really, again, to look at how uh, changing the norm of whiteness into the normal multicultural, cross-cultural and intersectionality that we need to, for the university to have for us to then serve California. Um, just as a request, um, there are many other um, members of the advisory council. If you could, if you're on, here on your, can you stand up so that we can acknowledge you also for that? So thank you very much for your service. Um, we are, I am also actually part of the council, but um, we're always happy to network and also hear from you what you want us to bring to the table. With that, I'm going to pass it along to our moderator who will introduce our speakers at this point, um, our familiar friend, Alfred Herrera. Thank you. Hello again. Uh, so you all know I'm Alfred. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves because they do it more passionately and they know more than I do. Um, and uh, I just wanna make sure, again, I was going to uh, ask everybody to stand, but I wanna uh, acknowledge Claudia Martinez who got uh, acknowledged earlier and Francis Contreras who are the co-chairs along with me. Um, and she, uh, we're gonna, talk a little bit about what we do and what our vision is and how we're gonna move forward. Part of this is really important because we want some suggestions from you. We wanna hear from you about ideas and things that we should be um, thinking about and moving towards as we try to help advise the system in ways that will be more inclusive for people from our community. So with that, I'm gonna ask um, our panel members, members to introduce themselves and talk about one of the committees that they're involved in, and then we'll open up for questions. We'll be very brief because we know that it's the end of the day. And you know, I must say the view from here is beautiful because if I look to, the, to here, I see all these brown faces. If I look over there, I see a sign that says Margaritas and that, and I look over there and it says Bloody Marys. And I think, how can I keep you all here? So with that, let me introduce Claudia Martinez. It's purple. Turn it on. Hear me? Okay, great. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Alfred mentioned, I'm Claudia Martinez. I work at the UC Office of the President um, in Diversity and Engagement. I'm uh, my formal title is Executive Director of Educator Programs. Um, I've been with the UC system, um, well, professionally uh, for 22 years this month and um, 35 uh, when I started as an undergraduate student here at Cal. So go Bears, I have to say that. I know there's so many friends and mentors in this room. Um, and one of the other areas of my responsibilities has been to support the Chicano Latino initiatives that are system-wide, um, several of which we've kicked off about two and a half years ago. Uh, Francis did a great job this morning of talking about the history of the Leadership Summit 
and some of the recommendations that were formed um, at a, a retreat at UCLA in 2017, one of which was to develop the Leadership Summit and host that on a regular basis. And the other is that we really needed um, a vehicle, a, um, a, a mechanism for a body, an advisory body, uh, that could bring together both um, staff and faculty who can bring their expertise and experience and, and knowledge um, to senior leadership at UCOP, at the campuses, and one that could really connect us all across the campuses in a way where we can make meaningful impact. Uh, I think it, it, it was not lost, and I know there's several of you in this room, um, and I know Professor Hurtado and Francisco Hernandez and Richard Duran and so many of you have, these are not new issues that we are addressing today. Um, and we have many more that we need to continue to address, and certainly Regent Bettis outlined a number of them as well. Um, I know it feels a little deja vu-y to many of us in this room, but we, did, we didn't want that to stop us from the fact that we needed to pull together um, a group of experts who can advise um, the president. And we also saw that with the number of campuses becoming Hispanic serving institutions, and we know that numbers are not the end all, but it was a policy window to be able to um, get the approval and the, the fiscal support that we needed to bring campuses together and develop the advisory um, council. So several of the folks involved with the Leadership Summit um, were invited to participate. Um, it's a work in progress. We've had two meetings. We launched in April of 2019. We identified um, some priorities that um, my, my other uh, fellow panelists will talk about, and uh, many of which we're talking about here today and tomorrow. And um, we do intend for it to be a permanent, um, ongoing body with, this, with your support and energy in this room. Um, I, I think one of the things that has been said today is, um, if not who, if not us, then who? Or if not now, then when? And I think that's what this advisory council is really trying to tackle, is that we have this opportunity, and even more so now with the new president um, coming on board, to be influential in ways that we know we need to in order to move um, the needle for not just students, but faculty and staff. So I'll just leave that there. and. As questions come up, I'm happy to answer, but I want to pass it on, give more time to others. Thank, Thank you. you. Blue one. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alejandra Rincon. I serve as Assistant Vice Chancellor and Chief of Staff at the Office of Diversity and Outreach at UCSF. It is uh, great to be here. And um, my piece, I'm also a co-founder of the Latinx, uh, the Chicanx Latinx uh, Campus Association at UCSF. And so I'll speak wait for my colleague to do the introduction, then I'll talk about the committee that I'm part of. But I wanted to um, start with an acknowledgement of the two people. I, I think I've heard so much today about sponsorship and mentorship and the people that identify us and give us an opportunity. And I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for the person that hired me into this role. So Renee, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to be here um, at UCSF. <laughs> Um, it's been a wonderful opportunity. I've learned a lot. I came from a nonprofit and I've learned a lot. And I also wanted to thank um, fellow uh, colleague here, Alfred Herrera, who has supported my scholarship around undocumented students for the past 15 years, if you can imagine that. So thank you. I'll stop right there. Good. Um, buenas tardes. Um, my name is Raquel Aldana. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Diversity at UC Davis and also a professor of law. Um, I'm a baby into the UC system. I am a byproduct of an elite um, education. I met Frances actually when I was at Harvard Law School and she was at, at Harvard getting her education degree. And I, I start there because I don't think I would have, um, there were two factors that um, helped me uh, uh, obtain this role as an outsider to the UC system. Um, one was um, the pedigree that unfortunately um, is, is a necessary factor, but it's not sufficient for, for us, it's the advocacy. So I also wanna acknowledge um, Adela de la Torre and Kevin Johnson um, who were instrumental um, in my recruitment and hire. Um, unfortunately, as that Tati mentioned, when Adela left, I quickly became the highest uh, ranking um, Latina at UC Davis. Um, it's not a source of pride uh, because I do think her departure 
um, as being the only S SMG um, at UC Davis was significant because she occupied not only a, an important position, but also one that was well-resourced and empowered. And I guess the broader point I wanna make is how important uh, it is to occupy this space as not just symbolically, but empowered by the leadership to be able to make um, just significant changes. Um, so I will only add one other comment, which is uh, one of my really wonderful uh, friends in law school, Luz Herrera, who is, if you have any of you know, know her, she's uh, pretty amazing. Um, she always used to say to me, if you're not at the table, you create your own table. And in some ways, this, this is a creation of, of our own table because uh, the data that you've heard, um, it's, it's, um, it means that when you are in leadership positions within the UC system, it can feel sometimes more isolating than you would want. Sometimes it feels more tokenized than I'm comfortable with. Um, and creating your own tables gives you a tremendous empowerment uh, and inspiration and uh, the possibility of collect collective impact. But I do want to say that it's very different to create your own table um, when you don't have people who are occupying the, the real table. And so I just want to say that it feels really different to have created this, ta this table at, at a time when Regent Pettis is leading. Um, and it's not simply a symbolic gesture to have his presence there, but it, we feel it um, in terms of feeling for the first time that it's not just our demographics uh, that are driving the agenda, but it's also a realization that there's an empowerment in the legislature and also in high leadership positions. It does feel a little bit more to me in the last three years that I've been at UC Davis that this is a different moment, and I think it's uh, we should feel... Um, good about that, that it's a different moment to, to, to feel like creating our own table is not such a disempowering uh, process. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge Professor Rudy Ortiz, who is also part of, uh, supposed to be part of our panel. Unfortunately, um, the flu got him and he was not able to join us, but he sends his wishes. So, the, um, so we, uh, as Claudia said, um, I feel, I'm sorry, I'm have my back to you. As Claudia said that um, we've met twice, trying to come up with an idea of who we are, what we're doing, what our goals are, what our visions were. And one of the things that we decided is to uh, create three areas that we felt we should start working on. I'm gonna name the three areas. Um, Rudy was gonna talk with one of them, uh, about one of them, but the other two will talk about the two that they're involved in. And they're new, so we haven't had an opportunity to really engage, fully engage in them. We've set, this, we've set the idea, we've set the mission, but now we're really gonna start doing the work on that. So the three committees are UC Faculty and Staff Career Pipeline, Leadership Development and Advancement, and Policy and Advocacy. And um, Alejandro's gonna talk about leadership development and uh, advancement, and Raquel's gonna talk about policy and advocacy briefly, because this is a conversation. We wanna just provide you with a, just a few pieces of information, and then we wanna hear from you about what you want us to help get, in, get started and engaged with. So, if I could ask Alejandra, please. So um, again, uh, we've only had one actual meeting on this topic and the idea, and I think a lot of you know, it's the importance of professional development. And so I think um, there is a lot of consensus about the importance of professional development. And from my own experience at UCSF, there is not there, there are a few topics for staff where there is more aspiration and more frustration around professional development. It is, as we know, a pathway to progress. It's a pathway to making connections, to coalescing with other people, to expanding your network. And unfortunately for staff of color, we see some of this through data. Um, and we have a Gallup survey that I think a lot of you have in your campuses. Staff of color report, primarily African-American and Latino, to have the lowest levels of engagement. And when you dig into the data, a lot of it is an equal distribution of advancement opportunities. So we have some of these programs in the system. Some of them we have through the core program where sadly they don't keep track of their data so that we know where and how are we represented, but not everyone has access to it. And when we dig a little bit deeper, we know and we ask those uh, members from our Latinx association, they don't have access, they don't know about these programs, or they ask about those programs or opportunities that come here or 
you know, last years, and they are denied by their supervisors. And so I think a lot of the conversation that we want to have today is kind of like, what is your experience? What are the ideas? The ideas that we have had is creating a fellows program that perhaps could be focused on Latinx issues, perhaps a program where we could rotate, you know, um, some of the internal um, Latinx staff around campuses, and also opportunities uh, for uh, recruitment. But I think I, I want to say that carefully, because I think there's a lot of talent within the UC system, and so we need to think of this program as an opportunity for retention and promotion. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so on the um, advocacy and policy, I think there's two ways to think about this. One is the degree to which we bring content uh, expertise to the room. Um, oftentimes in ways that isn't necessarily recognized or made visible. Um, so it's, it's, it's coming together to create collective impact so that our context, content expertise that we already bring to the table is recognized. The second is also to bring uh, a legitimacy to the issues that need to be recognized um, and an urgency to those, to those issues. And so we've talked about advocacy and policy being in two arenas. One is, is an arena that has implications beyond our own UC campuses, what's, what's happening in the state of California, what's happening in the nation that is affecting um, our communities and our students, um, but also advocacy within um, the UC system. And so who are the stakeholders? Who do we want both to see us as content experts and to consult with us? Um, but you know, uh, and who, to, who, and also to to be able to take us seriously. So we're targeting um, within the UCs. We want to be heard by the leadership, um, by the UC president, by the regents, um, beyond the UCs. We want to be able to also um, be able to have a partnership or a collaboration with obviously our leaders within the assembly, the Latino caucus, who are already advocating for many of the issues we care about. And it's creating a dual conversation and a dual support um, of each other's work, both within and outside. Um, so in order to move this forward, we have to be strategic thinking, right? So we have to think about not just, okay, so we have legitimacy, we have contact expertise, but but how do we strategically move the needle um, so that uh, we become more visible and so that our message is more urgent? And that gets us to think about alliances. And so I wanna bring it back to some of the conversation that you have already been hearing, which is that we have to build um, alliances um, with um, community groups, with alumni, with um, our political leaders with our regents, with other people who are pushing a similar agenda. So we have uh, started to think about what are the conversations that we need to have and what are the relationships that we need to build and how do we build that relationship. Um, again, it's about collective impact. Um, and so in order for us to be the most effective, I think we also, just a couple of things, is we need to hear from you about what are the issues that we need to be thinking about. Um, clearly all of us are thinking about some of the issues that have already been raised here. So we talked about DACA, and we have talked about the fact that um, the litigation, and so you heard Regent Pettis say, irrespective of the outcome, and frankly I'm a lawyer and I'm not sure that I'm that hopeful that the Supreme Court is going to give us a positive outcome in that case. In that case, um, but irrespective of the outcome, there are issues that we need to be thinking about preemptively or proactively because there are many generations. Uh, many of you know Ma that Maria Blanco has been leading in this area and she reminded me that the incoming uh, students into the UC system are already students who are non-DACA eligible. Um, and so we are going to face increasingly, irrespective of the outcome in the litigation, significant concerns around funding um, and support for these students. So that's clearly an issue that is already on our radar. But there are so many other issues that I could talk about that I think we need we need to hear from you. And I think we are we want to know what are the nuanced issues that are happening on your campus that you think could really benefit from having a more collective impact. Um, clearly we're weighing in also on the searches that are going on. Um, and so we have written a letter to the regents on our um, preferences 
both our values, but also individual people that we would like to see as the next president of the UC system. We wanna do the same for high level searches. So if you have names of people that you think that we ought to be promoting for whatever reason, reach out, reach out to any of us. The final thing I'll say as an idea is that we have also thought about how to empower the campuses so that it's not just a bunch of us meeting in rooms. And so we thought about, um, I, I'm a human rights lawyer, so I will use a term from human rights law is uh, in, you know, in situ or in local visits to campuses. So maybe there's a crisis going on or there's a reason to go to a campus as a collective unit. I think one idea is, is for you to invite us to come in and, and have conversations or a presence in a way that could elevate the voices that are um, necessary and perhaps are not being heard for whatever reason. So there's multiple ways to collaborate and rather than continue to talk, I would really love to hear your ideas on how you think we could be more effective to support the work that you're doing on the ground. Thank you. So we want to open it up to you. Uh, clearly, these two areas, we have the other area about faculty, but as, uh, as I mentioned, Rudy was going to talk about that. Um, but there are, if there are ideas, um, I wanted to acknowledge the, 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 the advocacy piece because we have some experts in the room. Um, obviously, we have Francesca, I think we have Elizabeth somewhere over here, Romero from Riverside, we've got Marco and Miguel. These are the people who on a daily basis interact with those elected officials that we need to tap into to make sure that our voices as a committee and as a body are heard and so forth. So let's open it up and give us some ideas about where we should be going and how we should be working to help our, our communities on our campus. Over here. The yellow. The yellow. yellow. <laughs> Not hello, yellow. <laughs> Not yellow, yellow. <laughs> it's late, okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Yesenia Curiel, and I, um, I'm from UC Merced. And one of the things that um, comes to mind is equity in regards to the Latino experience within professional realms. I came from working in a nonprofit bilingual organization, getting compensated for using my language. And then um, when I worked for the county providing mental health resources, I remember one day they said, well, can you translate for the psychiatrist? And I said, no one has tested me and I need to get that 5%. So then I would say no, and then right away they got me um, to the point where I was getting that 5%. So I think within the UC system, I've been uh, within my position for about three and a half years, and what I've noticed is that we're not compensating folks that are using their skills of being bilingual, being bicultural. So that's something where I would want this committee to advocate to make sure that if we're going above and beyond a white coworker by making sure that we are brushing up on our second language, that we are informed about what is happening within our communities, that we're fairly compensating when we're going above and beyond our, just our job description. And another point that I had was there's a lot of mental health crisis situations happening throughout uh, the UC system, and we need to create some kind of and I'm not sure if it's happened already in other campuses, but to, the, what I haven't seen is we're not providing uh, an individual or individuals that can navigate that with parents. Because oftentimes, the parent is the one that's going to um, reiterate the importance of looking for mental health resources. And if we're not giving that information to parents in their primary language, then how can they motivate their students for retention and success? So those are the two points that I have. And thank you. Thank you. Over here. Hi, my name is Crystal Petrini from UC Riverside. And I um, also second Yesenia's point about bilingual uh, staff and faculty. I think we're taken advantage of in a lot of our positions because we speak another language with no compensation to follow. Um, but I also wanted to bring up the point that we talk so much about Hispanic serving institutions and making sure that the, our institutions are ready to serve our Latinx populations. But we also need to think about how we can serve our Latinx or our uh, staff and faculty of color as well, because I don't think that we're doing enough 
to retain staff and faculty of color. We're not making our campuses a welcoming place for them to do their jobs. And I think we can do much better and we can be a pilot for all institutions across the country. Thank you. Over here, Josefina. Josefina Canchola from the Puente Project, UC Berkeley. Um, I'm glad you talked about the importance of advocacy because um, I was like straightforward once told, you know, anything uh, related to academic preparation programs, in particular this conversation, it's not a priority for the university. A la brava. That was the statement. And, and so at that point, I realized that if we were not the voices for the advocacy for academic preparation programs and for other issues that are related to the Chicano Latino community, then who will it be? And so the, the one challenge I think is to really teach particularly our younger staff and faculty how to navigate through those tough conversations so that they don't lose their jobs. Because a lot of times, you know, you're putting yourselves on the line to make sure that that advocacy happens. Uh, under other names like education of legislators or whatever else that we're doing. Um, and I think it's important that as a collective body that we empower ourselves to be those advocates and to not be afraid and to teach how to become effective advocates because not everybody knows the how-tos. And so, um, so I'm putting out there in terms of the things that we need to teach each other uh, particularly the younger uh, staffers that are coming in and, and faculty that are coming on board. Hello, everybody. My name is Josephine Moreno, second Josefina to speak in a row. Uh, and I am a graduate diversity officer at UC Davis. I've been there for six years, and I was at UC Berkeley for 12 years prior. And what I would like to suggest to our group here is that it's, uh, and this suggestion comes from a focus on disproportionate approach, which was mentioned earlier, uh, faculty development, and graduate education. And that is one way to approach um, the diversity needs amongst our graduate st student uh, population is for all of us to come together, all 10 campuses, and to embrace holistic review in graduate admissions. Okay, that's how we're getting, that's how we're increasing uh, diversity at the undergraduate level, and we should take those cues from the undergraduates and uh, embrace holistic review. I, I would like to offer UC Davis as a point campus, our provost and I are on a um, significant uh, grant uh, funded by the, Af the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, as well as our Dean, De Dean J.P. Del Planck, and we would be very happy to help to guide a conversation. But I think this is one thing that all of us could do, and it is making a big difference on our campus. And I do want to say that it doesn't stop there. And that is that if, we're av if we are admitting more students of color, um, more black and brown students, um, we also need to be able to fund them. So that's another whole issue, but we have to admit them. And we have to admit them at the graduate student level. So uh, my suggestion is holistic review, graduate admissions, and to bring together all 10 campuses um, to really um, move forward as an institution. Any over here? We have time for one or two more. Right, oh, he's bringing it over here. And then we have one over here. I think um, Marcela Ramirez Stapleton, uh, UC Irvine Cross Cultural Center. Um, I think going back to um, Hilda Solisa's comments earlier, I think um, if the policy and advocacy kind of like group has um, key points or a platform, I'd really love to see like a lobby day where we could go speak to our legislators in Sacramento, right after the group has collectively agreed on the things that we wanna advocate for. Um, I would love to see something like that, be involved in something like that. So if we could do it, um, let's make it happen. Amanda Corona with UC San Diego. I'm the alumni director. And with 
um, adding on to faculty and staff, also utilizing our alumni as a really a big, huge power horse for something like a legislative day or for advocacy and faculty and support. So really thinking of alumni as well. Okay, well, thank you all very much. I know that there are lots more, but let me just ask the committee, clack, we call ourselves clack, not quack, clack, um, <laughs> to stand up again. If you're a member of the Chicano Latino Advisory Committee to the President. Okay, so stay standing because if you don't know who your representative is, we have two, two representatives per campus, a faculty member and an administrator staff, slash staff person. If you don't know who they are, let us know. We'll make sure that you do because what we need is for you to continue to provide these comments and suggestions for how we move forward. This is not a group that's gonna just talk in between, I mean, between ourselves. We need the input of all of you standing here, sitting here today. So it is really important to engage that. Great ideas and suggestions. We will move them to our next meeting, which is, I don't know when soon. Um, but we um, really do appreciate your involvement in that. So we're almost at, we're at the end of this formal part. It has been a long day. Oscar's going to come up and uh, tell us what to do next, but uh, let's thank our panel. Oh, one more comment. Yeah, Sorry, wanted, one more comment. Just wanted to add to what Alfred was saying about the membership. Please do engage with, with your representative, and we are, before I know folks will ask, we are working on, um, on our alumni and student representation yes. for the council as well. We just, we're working through the process right now of identifying student representatives and, and, and at least one alumni representative that may become a rotating type of position. So we're just trying to figure out the right process for that, but it is something that we have considered and want, and want to make good on, so. Thank you, you know. let's thank them. Uh,